me ask you a question this morning. How do you know you're getting old? <laughs> Let me count the ways. Well, Greg Laurie puts it this way. He says, you know you're getting old when you actually look forward to a dull evening at home. <laughs> you know you're getting old when you sink your teeth into a big, juicy steak, and they stay there. <laughs> you know you're getting old when you sing along with elevator music. Now, now some of you youngsters might not know what elevator music is. You know where you're getting old when you quit trying to hold your stomach in no matter who enters the room. <laughs> well, you know, like it or not, we're all getting old, aren't we? Everyone in this room is getting older day by day, minute by minute. In fact, Warren Wiersbe put it this way. He said, outlook determines outcome. Attitude determines action. What is your attitude? What kind of attitude does it take for you to enjoy getting old? You see, getting old isn't a bad thing. I can attest to that. I'm old as dirt. Well, Ruth is, but I'm not. Getting old, we start weathering more storms in life. We start having more aches and pains. Sometimes it's just hard to get out of bed sometimes, you know? But that's okay. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. This is where God, through the Apostle Peter, gives us some advice to a, a group of believers that are going through some persecution by the Emperor Nero. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says this. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're going to live a life worth living today, then you need to anticipate God's grace tomorrow. You need to be totally aware of his unconditional love. His undeserved, our undeserved blessings that he gives each one of us each day as we take a breath. As we get out of bed, we need to say, God, thank you for another day that you've, you've given us. And the older we get, the older I get, the more aware I am of that because Every day could be my last day. But you know that doesn't happen just with old people, does it? Because automobile accidents happen, heart attacks happen. Life in general happens. So every day, with God's unconditional love for each one of us, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. I can remember when I was a little boy growing up in Detroit, my dad worked for this engineering firm, and as a result, he had to take business trips throughout the week. And sometimes he was gone three, four, sometimes five days a week, and, and we missed him. But one good thing we got out of that was we knew that when he was coming back, he'd bring us something. And my sister and I, we anticipated that gift. So his being gone... We were almost joyful, kind of, sometimes, if you can understand that, because we knew at the end of the week when he returned, he would bring us something. Folks, at Christ's return, we will have everything. Amen. Everything. And that might be today, tomorrow. Who knows when that's going to happen? For the last 2,000 years, we've been anticipating the Lord's return. But with that anticipation, we have hope, we have joy, we have blessings. 
no matter what we're going through, we have that anticipation of Jesus coming back. Because as a believer in Christ, we are guaranteed of the future. And what a blessing that is. We have an incorruptible inheritance. And God's protecting power over each one of you as a believer in Christ. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing? Boy, for me it is. I don't know how I got through the first 26 years of my life. I should be dead. But God allowed me to live just for this moment. And we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful every breath we take. So what you need to do, you need to discipline your mind. You need to control your thoughts and keep them focused. Remember the very first Sunday I was here, I talked about blinders, horse blinders. Now, I'm a city boy. We, the only horses I saw in, the, in Detroit back in the 50s were these junk guys coming through the alley picking up junk. And they had horses with blinders on. And I told you about Mr. Green, and I, I asked Mr. Green one time, the farmer across the street from my grandma and grandpa, why do you have blinders on those horses? So they can stay focused, straight ahead. Every one of us should have blinders on, folks, so we can stay focused on the Lord. Verse 13 says, prepare your minds. Prepare your minds. Literally, that means gird up your loins. Gird up your mind. You see, in Bible days, the robes that the men wore, when they would be walking to work, they would pick that up and bring it between their legs and put it in their belt. That's what girding up your loins means. And that's what we need to do. We need to gird up our loins, gird up our mind, so we can stay focused on the Lord. Today, we might say, we're going to roll up our sleeves. I, I intentionally didn't wear a long sleeve shirt. You know what would have happened. It would be, I'd be dripping wet right now. Vance Harner, I, I believe this, he said this. He said, you can't be optimistic with a mystic optic. It takes a clear head to be optimistic. And for that, you need to rely on the Lord. You need to sit down sometimes and say, Lord, what do you have in store for me? What do you want me to do? How can I serve you? When Ruth and I were pastoring up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we lived next to the Air Force Base. And I loved being able to go on that military base with my former ID and just sitting in the car watching those jet planes take off. To me, that was fascinating. I used to have a pilot's license. I, I flew Cessnas and, and, and King Airs and nothing fast, you know. Fastest I got was, was maybe 600 miles an hour. These guys go Mach 1, Mach 2, you know. They, they go quick. Can you imagine these pilots training if they see a MiG a couple of miles out coming towards them, they just can't fool around and say, well, gee, we've got all these switches up here. Uh, uh, let's see, that one, uh, I think that's for the bomb. No, 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 no. Everything they do is by instinct. And they have to do it right now. They can't wait. That's what getting into God's Word and praying does for us. It gives us the instinct so that when problems, when countless issues come along that, that sometimes we can't handle in the flesh, we're able to turn to God's Word and then get on our face before the Lord and say, Lord, what am I to learn from this? You see, that's instinct. That's like that fighter pilot with that MiG coming through. He just doesn't wait. He starts throwing switches right and left. That's what God's Word does for us. 
It will give us instinctive benefits by getting into God's Word on a daily basis. Folks, that's important as a, as a Christian, as a believer in Christ. Listen, I know, I know believers that, that never get into the book. They're still believers. They're still going to heaven. But think of what they're missing. Think of what they're missing in life. Not knowing that the Bible says this. The Apostle Paul said this. What a blessing that is. And even more than that, we need to imitate God's character. We need to imitate God's character. 1 Peter 1, beginning with verse 14, says this. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The argument here is quite simple, folks. Children us, we're God's children, should reflect the nature of their parent. You ever go into a grocery store or some place, church even, and watch kids? They are so much like their parents. It blows my mind. They have the mannerisms, you know. They sit, they talk, they think, they act, they walk just like their parents. That's what we're supposed to do with God. How do we get that? Through his word, through reading, through memorizing, through putting it into practice. Do not conform to your former self, but conform to God. We are supposed to be different. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to be different. In fact, it uses the word peculiar. Now, Ruth says, I'm just downright weird sometimes. But that's what we need to be. We need to be downright weird. People need to notice that we're different. But instead, I'm sorry to say, we become so much like the world. If we were to rewrite the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, according to the world view, well, here's what we would get. Blessed are those who fly to luxury vacation spots on tropical islands where they lie in cheese lounges, the only two people on an enormous white beach, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who drink much beer, for they shall be surrounded by carefree football-watching buddies and highly attractive socially gifted women in the first half of life, and they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who have the latest smartphone, for they shall gaze at that screen, swirling with color, and shall get all the information they need, just as when they need it, and they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who have outstanding kids. Verily, verily, I say to you, Highly blessed are those who have a golden Labrador retriever bounding along in that slow motion video. You know, you've seen that? With the kids in the park, for they shall be the envy of real families everywhere, and they shall be satisfied. What a bunch of baloney. Amen. And you know what? We know that. But we fall into it, don't we? We do. How many of you got a smartphone? I'm raising my hand. I got one. I got the 14 plus. I didn't want just the 14. I wanted the big one. It's got the big screen. Oh, I love it. Folks, we know better, don't we? We know better than to fall in the trap of Satan wants us to do. To go back to our old self. When you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, he made you a new creature. A new creation. 
And we're supposed to act and be new creatures. But so many, so many fail. And that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. Because you go to work and they see that you're just an ordinary Joe, nothing different about you. We need to be different. Why? Because we're children of God. He adopted us into his family. 1 John 1.12 says, To all who receive Christ, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Amen. What a great verse that is. Folks, when you received Christ, when you welcomed him into your life, God made you his child. Praise God for that. At the very least, it means you've got God's nature in you. Now change. Get into his word daily. Get on your knees daily. That's what he wants us to do. Folks, all life is sacred. It's important. Frank Gentry, back in 19, or I'm sorry, 2004, created a Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. Any of you ever see it? There it is. Isn't that ugly? It's all shining stainless steel. There are condominiums all around it. And those condominiums heat up during the day because the sun shines on that thing, no matter what angle it is, and shines in and on patios and into condominiums that people pay millions and millions of dollars for. So they weren't happy. This forced the residents to get off their patios, to, to draw the blinds, to turn on the air conditioner in the wintertime. One of the ladies said you couldn't even see. And then the furniture you sat on got really hot, even on the inside. So they took means. They started trying to disguise it. Hype. Put different films on it to take the glimmer off of it. That didn't work, did it? When they did that, it looked terrible. The architect didn't like it. Walt Disney didn't like it. Too often, people try to tone down God in your life. We try to tone that down. Why? Because, oh, it may be offensive to somebody. They might see me as being different. Well, good. Good. Be different. Be peculiar. Be weird, as Ruth says I am. That's okay. With God's help, we need to express His holy nature within us. No matter where we're at, the grocery store. Now, it's easy to come into this building. We all look so pretty sometimes. I can't wait to Christmas and Easter. Because everybody will be dressed up. You know, back in the day, my mother used to wear a little pillbox hat and white gloves. What happened, women? Oh, now wait a minute. Men all used to wear suits and ties. Ah, what happened? You see, it's not the outward appearance. It's the inward appearance. I don't care what you wear. Just as long as you wear Jesus. That's important. Bill White was a pastor of Emmanuel Reformed Baptist Church in Paramount, California. And he talked about a man who worked in the church. This man was a drunk. He lost his wife. He lost his family. He lost everything went on the streets, almost lost his life. 
God saved him. Somebody in the church took a chance by hiring him in a sheet metal company. Bill got so serious for God, he said, God, my first paycheck, I'm going to give it to you. Now, he'd been out of work for months. Bills were piling up. But you know what he did? That first paycheck, he gave it to God. Today, in 2023, Bill owns that sheet metal company. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because he was faithful to God. And God was faithful to him. Isn't that amazing how God works sometimes? You see, you need to trust God with your life, folks. Because he gave his son for your life. None of us would be here without Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, we live like it sometimes, don't we? And finally, through Christ, through our life in Christ, we need to respect the Father's judgment and love. We need to fear God, who is our assessor and redeemer. 1 Peter 1.17 says, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear, throughout the time of your exile. God loves you. But he's going to judge you. It's going to happen. Every one of us is going to stand before him. And I don't know about you, but it scares me. Because even though I know he's forgiven me for a lot of things, there's a lot of things I should have done in life that I didn't, that I will still stand accountable for. I will stand accountable for you as your pastor and the other eight churches that we've pastored. That's a heavy responsibility. I fear God. But I love him. And I know he loves me. If you have put your faith in Christ, you never need to fear that he's going to condemn you because he's not going to. Christ paid the price for that on the cross. He paid for your sins and mine. Don't fear condemnation as a child, but as a child of God, sometimes we disappoint him. I can remember growing up, my dad had very high standards for me, standards that I couldn't meet. I tried not to do that with my own children. But I could never meet my dad's expectations. And I tried, and I tried hard. You see, we don't have to do that with God. We don't have to fear that. But we do have to try. Because there's going to be a day when God's going to evaluate us. And the work that we do and the work that we don't do. You know, we took those, those uh, spiritual gift assessments. And we're working on those. And next week we're going to be, be interviewing a lot of different people. So every one of you is going to get interviewed at some point. And we're going to find out not only what your spiritual gift is. And most of you know those now. But what you want to do to serve him. And if you're not trained to do that, we're going to train you to do that. If you want to be a, a Sunday school teacher and that fits in with your spiritual gift, we're going to help you be, a, be an apprentice. Or in children's church or some other place. That's what God wants us to do, is to serve him, folks. Serve him. 
Back in 2004, there was an Olympic medal right in the sights of a man by the name of Matt Emmons. He was a, he was a shooter, one of these, these guys that, that uh, go on, on uh, skis and then stops and shoots. I don't know what they call that sport. But he had the gold medal in his vision. All he needed was to hit the target, and he'd have that gold medal. You know what he did? He made a bullseye. Wrong target. He was in lane two. He shot the target in lane three. We do that sometimes. We have our eyes focused so much on what we want to do that our target is wrong. We need to ask God. Ask him, Heavenly Father, what would you have me to do for First Southern Baptist Church? And then do it. God loves you. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Bill Bright said that one time. That was in the Four Spiritual Laws. That was very popular back in the 70s. I wish it would come back. Folks, God loves you. And he wants you to know that he's there for you. No matter what you're going through at this time, he's there for you. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for this very simple message of God's love. For what Peter went through. What those Christians went through being terrorized by Nero. But still having the faith, knowing that you and you were in control. Father, help us to realize that no matter what we're going through right now, you're there. Father, we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus.